Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 14. We finally finished chapter 13. That was quite a few weeks, but a lot of important information and a lot of important challenges for the Christian life as we were looking at Acts chapter 13. And we find more of them tonight in Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. But so that we'll understand our context as to what is happening and why it's happening, I'm going to start reading here in verse 42 of chapter 13. So Acts 13, beginning in verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came together almost the whole city to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But, seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Gracious Father, we pray for your blessing on your word tonight as it goes forth. We pray that you will encourage our hearts, that you will direct our steps, that you will open our mouths to speak with boldness the word of God. Father, help us to be like Paul and Barnabas, who were not afraid to speak in the face of sometimes very violent opposition. Help us to have the courage of which we've just sung, because we have on the whole armor of God. Help us, Father, to learn how to stand against the wiles and the treachery and the trickery and the lies and the deceit of the devil. Father, we pray for your blessing upon your word tonight, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to do a quick review for the last two weeks because what we see starting here at the end of Acts chapter 13 is going to not merely progress as we move into chapter 14, but it is going to intensify. There are three different levels of intense persecution that come against the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And that is the same process that Satan uses when he begins to oppose your testimony with the gospel of Christ. And so I'm going to do a very brief review of what two weeks ago we did and what last week we did so that we will understand the flow and the full impact of what we see tonight in chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, which we'll read in a moment. Two weeks ago, the first thing that we noticed was neither Paul nor Barnabas backed down or soft-pedaled their message when they got strong opposition. Too many American Christians, when they hesitantly share Christ and yet even the mildest opposition sort of backpedal and say, well, I'm sorry, and they begin to apologize, and the other person then gets a little more encouraged and says, don't shove your religion down my throats, and they say, oh, oh, I won't do it again. That's not the way that we find Paul and Barnabas responding. When the opposition increased, the boldness and the confrontation 
that Paul and Barnabas made increased also. We saw that the second thing was that Paul followed the same principal approach that he always followed. We'd seen this before, but he first went to the Jews, he went to the synagogues, and gave them the first chance to hear the gospel. And then, upon rejection, he would carry that message to the Gentiles. And we saw the foundational doctrinal basis for that in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Romans 2, 9, and Romans 2, 10, where it says to the Jew first, and then to the Greek. The reason the salvation was offered to the Jews first was because, A, they were given the Old Testament revelation as a stewardship. That's what Romans 3 is all about. Secondly, the Messiah was promised to come through the Jews, the lineage of Abraham. Three, they had the necessary foundation upon which to build a true theology without intermingling paganism. And so when Paul went to a city, he wanted to establish a place whereby they already had a foundation in Old Testament knowledge, and then those who were saved from among the Gentiles could be brought together with those who already had some stability in knowledge of the Old Testament prophecies. That's the reason for to the Jews first. But according to Romans chapter 2, salvation was offered to the first, first to the Jews because, number one, they were going to be the first to be held accountable and judged because of sin. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. And secondly, it was offered first to the Jews because they were the first in judgment. They would also be the first in blessing. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The bottom line for that is to whom much is given, from him much is required. Jesus said so. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of strife shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever is much given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. What has God given to you? You say, only he'll give me a little bit. <laughs> You're going to be held accountable for it. And he, I suspect that he's probably given to you more than you think he's given to you. You have freedom to read, study, proclaim the word of God. You've got an entire Bible in the English language. How many cultures are there in the world that wish they had an entire Bible in their language? We've had it for centuries. You are accountable for knowing what's in here. You are accountable for knowing what's in here. You can read. Every one of you in this room can read. Every one of you has the same 168 hours in a week that everybody else has. The most important thing in your life should be to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and what does he want you to do with your life, not merely what kind of a theology does he want you to have in a box that you set on a shelf and you only look at it for two hours on Sunday. Accountability. To whom much is given from him shall much be required. The third thing that we noticed was the contrast between the phrases related to eternal life in verses 46 and 48. First, Paul puts them under accountability and being responsible for what they do with what they've heard. He says, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. When we're looking at the human uh, level, we're looking at responsibility that each one of us are going to be held accountable for. You can't just pass it off and say, well, you know, God's up there and he's sovereign and us, so I really can't be held accountable. The Bible contradicts what you have to say, if that's what you say, because the second phrase is just one, two verses later. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Two contrasting phrases. One deals with your accountability. One deals with God's sovereignty. Both of them are absolutely true. And you can't eliminate one so that you can hold on to the other, whichever is your favorite. Paul sets those two balancing truths, that is of sovereignty and of accountability, in contrast in a more extensive passage in 2 Thessalonians. And we discussed that quite detailed some weeks ago, so I'll only summarize it for you here. The discussions about the second coming of Christ, the rise of the Antichrist, and how God holds those who follow the Antichrist accountable. And we find as we get down to verse 10 in that passage there, uh, the Antichrist has showed up. His coming is with the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. 
Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because, important word, when you see a because, or when you see a therefore, ask what it's there for. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They're accountable. They heard it, they mulled it over in their minds, and they spit it out. They received not the love of the truth, human accountability. But we get down to verse 13. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because, there it is again, because, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now you can't get any plainer than that. God has chosen you, if you are among the elect, God has chosen you to salvation. There's a balance for every doctrine in scripture. Human accountability is balanced with sovereignty. Sovereignty is balanced with human accountability. There is only one God, but the Trinity is true, and you can go through every doctrine of Scripture and you'll find that there are balancing truths in the Bible. The fourth thing that we looked at, we saw Paul and Barnabas were willing to obey God no matter what the cost. Most of us are willing to obey God as long as it doesn't cost. But they were willing to obey even if it did cost. And they said so, for so hath the Lord commanded us. And that led to that key quotation out of Isaiah that we studied in some detail and has some fascinating references in the New Testament. It was a quote from Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. And Paul applies that passage and says that was speaking about me because I am here and I'm fulfilling that passage to be a light to the Gentiles. We saw it also as alluded to in Isaiah chapter 49, 6, and we see that prophecy also given in the context of Luke 2, 32, where Jesus is brought to the temple for his circumcision. And I'll not go into it tonight, but I mean, he is a light, the light in the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel, and Paul is preaching Jesus. We see it quoted again in Paul's defense before King Agrippa, it's the last thing that he says before he's interrupted. Festus is very squeamish about this Jewish-Gentile connection. He's, you know, a governmental authority in a, a nation of Jewish people who don't like Gentiles. And Paul, as he is preaching before Agrippa, the last reference that he makes is to this passage out of Isaiah. And he says... And thus he spake for himself, as he spoke for himself, a Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Festus got very squeamish in the sermon at that point, because he realized there were Jews present, and, you know, there was this separation of Jews and Gentiles, and, you know, how can you put the two together and you're going to be a light to the Gentiles? And he, whoa, whoa, let's stop this sermon. And that brought us back to Acts 13. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. The Gentiles said, you know, all these years we've lived here among Jews. All these years we've been considered second-class citizens. All these years we're found on the reject shelf. Does the Bible, the Jewish Bible, actually say that there is hope for Gentiles? And Paul said the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And that's why we're here tonight. You and I, as primarily Gentiles, would not be here were it not for the fact that God had made some promises in the Old Testament and he fulfilled them in the New Testament when he opened the door for the Gentiles to come into the body of Christ, Acts chapter 10. So in spite of the fact that Paul knew he was speaking explosive words, it was the truth. And that's why we see him being bold. And in our text for tonight, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 14, we find that same phrase used about his boldness in the face of opposition. And you know, you never know what incredible positive results you will get when you speak the truth boldly. Because four things there happened. Number one, the immediate audience was filled with joy. Number two, God in his word received the glory. Number three, the elect were saved. And number four, the new believers zealously spread the gospel through the whole region. 
But then we saw the opposition last week in the last three verses, and it was opposition from unexpected people. Now, you know the Holy Spirit had already run the victory because we have, in the, the preceding verse, in verse 49, we have the word of God being spread throughout the entire region. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of people being saved. God always gets in the first licks. God always wins. But Satan will always raise opposition. And that's what we find going on here. The Holy Spirit had already given the victory before the enemy got his act together. The Gentiles heard this, they were glad, glorified the Lord, the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But just remember, when Satan gives the first punch, he's going to follow up with a second punch. It happens all the time. And if you keep letting your guard down, he's going to follow with a third punch, he's going to follow with a fourth punch. You need to make sure that your armor is ready, that you've got your shield of faith up, that you've got the sword of the Spirit, the word of God in your hand, so that when Satan attacks, you quench the fiery darts of the evil one, and you attack with the sword. The gates of hell will not stand against you. Jesus promised that. Gates don't move. You're the one that moves. You're supposed to be on the offensive. You're supposed to be the one that is storming the gates of hell. Most of us put ourselves in a defensive position. We don't do like Paul did. He walked into battle. He walked in proclaiming the truth of God and the opposition rose. We're going to see that people tracked him. There were people who were tracking Paul from city to city to city to city because they hated the gospel so much. It wasn't just different people in each city that he went that raised opposition. When Paul moved from city to city, the people in the preceding city began to track him and they'd get some more in the next city. And then that group would track him and they would get some more in the next city and then that group would track him. How would you like it to be? Suppose you were an itinerant evangelist where you're traveling from church to church or from city to city and it wasn't just a matter of opposition from that city but you had this whole group of people following you ten people perhaps from the first city and second city they get another twelve or fifteen and the third city they get another thirty or forty and the next city they get seventy five to a hundred and pretty soon you know you've got your own congregation traveling with you but it's a traveling congregation that's totally opposed to your message that's what happened to Paul and Barnabas. And we'll see that as we get farther in the text. It specifically tells us that that was what was happening. And then the less, second lesson that we learned is that the devil has his people in very unexpected places. In this case, the first punch was the devout and honorable women. And those were good people. You don't expect the good people to be on the attack. Those were people who never raised trouble. Those were people who were always quiet and submissive. Those were religious women. They were devout. That is, that they were those who were practicing clearly principles set forth by God in the Word. And those were the first group that raised opposition to Paul and Barnabas. It also says that they were honorable women. They're well-known, high sense of honor, impeccable reputation. They were not women of ill repute, women of the streets, women of the red light district. These were the honorable women that everybody in the city knew. These were the high-class socialite types. The second thing that we saw was, of course, the city leaders. The city leaders came and they got stirred up by the honorable women and they said we want peace in our city we're here for economic prosperity we're here to keep order we're here to protect the population and so rather than calling a trial and finding out what really was going on easiest thing is just to get rid of the outsiders how many times have churches just gotten rid of outsiders by shunning them by not being friendly to them I've been in churches when we've been on vacation churches that had many many people in it we would come in and the church would be packed we'd find some little place to sit and undoubtedly it belonged to somebody else who hadn't gotten there when we did and uh, we'd sit there and then after the service was over not one person moved in our direction I know of a specific church in Virginia where this happened to us it was clear that we were outsiders and not one person in that church greeted us or tried to shake our hand or welcome us or find out who we were, where we were from. 
probably three to four hundred people walked past us and looked the other way. Dear people, the body of Christ should be a warm embrace. The body of Christ should seek to find out who are the new folks? Are these folks that need Christ or are these brothers and sisters with whom we can share fellowship and you know might even learn something not just about them learn something from them dear people be a warm church be a church that loves to welcome the stranger a church that reaches out to those whom perhaps you might initially feel some reluctance to but God brought them here for purpose God brought them here for a purpose and you're being put to a test at that point as to will you follow biblical principles or will you turn your back I hadn't said that before and so that's just an extra throw in tonight the third lesson that we learned is temporal setbacks should not be a discouragement for the believer who knows that he is in the center of God's will Paul and Barnabas experienced a temporal setback but did it discourage them no because they knew they were in the center of God's will in fact it says in verse 51 they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to unto Iconium all they were doing was merely following the command of the Lord Jesus Christ it wasn't a matter of scorn or hatred for that city it wasn't bitterness it wasn't anger they saw that their work in one place was finished and so they moved to the next mission field some mission fields are open for a long time some mission fields are only open for a very short time the issue is what are you going to do will you do what you're called to do and then move on remember what Jesus said he said and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead cast out devils freely you have received freely give and he tells them not to take all this excess baggage along and lots of money and all that kind of stuff and then he tells them if you come to a city in a house and if they're worthy give it peace if they reject what you have to say when you depart out of the house or city shake off the dust of your feet verily I say unto you it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city and then he brings up a very interesting it's Jesus speaking here brings up a very interesting point because it's the same point that Paul makes to the Jews at Antioch of Pisidia and that he makes at Iconium and Lystra and Derby and the whole region of Lycaonia which is our text tonight here's what Jesus says you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles and you know that's what we see going on in the book of Acts as the gospel reaches out to the Gentiles the fourth lesson we learned was when the Holy when the Word of God takes root with true conversions the original leaders can leave the follow-up to the Holy Spirit without worry or fear or angst and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost and that brings us to our four verses for tonight so that gives you the background as how we're moving forward and how the opposition is beginning to increase chapter 14 verse 1 and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together that's Paul and Barnabas into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of the Greeks believed remember God gets his licks in first when Satan sees what's going on he's going to raise opposition and that's verse 2 but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren long time therefore abode they speaking get this next word you've just heard it it's what they did back in the previous one when they got opposition speaking boldly in the Lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace I wish I could spend a, a long time on that but we've already talked about the grace message that Paul preached and how that was this thing that suddenly caused the Jews antenna to go up and be alert because they preached a law message and not a grace message so what are they preaching the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands but the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part held with the Apostles 
Now, there's a lot in this passage. I'll get through it as quickly as I can. The first thing that we learn from our text tonight is that opposition to the gospel will follow every faithful man or woman no matter where they go. Opposition to the gospel will follow every faithful man or woman no matter where they go. You can't run away from opposition to the gospel if you're faithful. You can't hide from it if you're faithful. Those who hear the gospel and harden their hearts will not want you to preach the same truth anywhere else. Not just where they are. They won't want you to preach it anywhere else either. Paul and Barnabas had been in Antioch of Pisidia in chapter 13 where we are given that extensive overview of the message. They proclaimed everywhere that they went. They've now moved to Iconium, which is about 50 miles east of Antioch and Pisidia. 50 miles. That may not seem very far away for us today with superhighways and automobiles. We can get there in an hour. But remember, they were walking across some very rugged country. Now, Paul and Barnabas were motivated by the Spirit of God to carry the gospel to the regions beyond to places where Christ had never been named. And they were willing to walk those roads. Did you know the devil's people are willing to rock those roads too? The devil's people, who are tracking Paul and Barnabas, as we'll see in just a moment, they had to walk the roads too. That means that they quit doing whatever jobs they were doing back at home. That means that they had made arrangements for somebody to take care of their wife and kids. That means that they had set aside all the money-earning capacity that they had so that they could make a trip to stop the gospel. Satan's people are dedicated, folks. And they're empowered by the devil. And they're willing to make or pay the cost and take the suffering. And sometimes God's people are not. So here they are. They follow them 50 miles east. They're walking across rugged country. The opposing Jews who followed them from Antioch of Pisidia had to be very determined to stamp out the gospel message to go all that trouble to track them and oppose the message. We're going to discover when we get later in the chapter down in verse 6 and 19 that in the next two places Paul and Barnabas went, the unbelieving Jews trailed them as well to Lystra and Derbe in the region of Lacaonia and its surrounding territory as mentioned. The original persecutors from Antioch of Pisidia picked up more gospel opponents in Iconium, verse 19. And there came hither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. That's verse 19. That's just a few verses farther in the text. These are people who are traveling along and picking up opponents as they go so that they can make their attack. And the attack gets more and more severe as we get farther into the text. You know, I think that that kind of an attack like being stoned <laughs> that would be a pretty good deterrent to most traveling evangelists. But it didn't stop Paul. Instead, he decided to go back to the very place. After this stoning, he decided to go back to the very place that was the original source of the persecution. It says so in verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Doesn't that sound like Paul was a man who was just asking for trouble? I mean, wouldn't you want to try to avoid cities where that kind of opposition had come to your preaching? Go to some place where they really like to hear it? Paul understood that God would take him safely as long as God wanted him to be safe. But he knew he had a responsibility to the believers who had trusted Christ in each of those cities. And so he comes back to encourage the believers in the places where he had already preached the gospel. He knew that they would get opposition, but they hadn't been through what he'd been through, and some of them might falter, some of them might be weak, some of them might be a little hesitant in their faith. And he went back all the way to Antioch where he got his first opposition. He went to Iconium where the Jews from Antioch had gathered some more opposition, and to Lystra where the Jews had gathered some more opposition. He went back. Are you willing to go back to where you've had your opposition? Maybe it was from a co-worker. Maybe it was from a friend. Maybe it was from a relative. Are you willing to go back and hit it again and again and again? 
and again. Are you bold in it? That's what we see as the example given by Paul and Barnabas. And it's interesting also to notice that here as we get into Iconium, that they didn't merely shake the dust off their feet at Lystra and Derbe and Iconium as they had done at Antioch and Pisidia. That's very interesting. And I think the text gives us a reason for that. The reason is probably because the opposition in those later cities did not originate with the people in the cities themselves. They originated from the initial source of the opposition. It was instigated by an outside source. The second thing that we learn in our passage for tonight that stands out is the consistent approach of Paul in every city that he visited. Verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, we've already studied that in detail, so we'll only mention the fact that it's here, but Paul's, discussion, Paul's approach to missions um, was to go to the Jews first. The third thing that is of interest is that not only Paul preached, but Barnabas also preached. We know that. Barnabas also preached. We can see that in the plural form used in the word they spoke. In the Greek, it's in the plural. It's not just he spoke, Paul spoke. Both were involved in preaching so that we don't get the wrong idea that only an apostle could have the kind of results that we see taking place in this passage. And so spoke in the plural form refers to them both. The fourth thing that we must always recognize is when the Holy Spirit does a work of power, Satan will immediately raise opposition because he has his people, and you know this, I'm sure, but think about it, he already has his people in every location on the face of the earth. He's been at it for several thousand years, making sure that he establishes his own little bunkers, those concrete things with the gun sticking out, so that if God, who is his arch enemy, and he the arch enemy of God, if God's people come into range, he's going to have his cannons ready. But you know, God always wins. It says, both the great multitude of the Jews and also the Greeks believed, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Did you notice? There are two things that the unbelieving Jews did. And two different words are used. Number one, it says they stirred up. Whatsoever they were saying caused agitation. There's a word dealing with agitation. We're not told exactly what they said. Perhaps they merely were citing the revolt of the women in Antioch of Pisidia and the expulsion by the city leaders. The word is different than the word, though, that was used back in Acts 13.50, where it says the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women. A different word for stirred up is used just a few verses earlier. In fact, that word back in chapter 13 is a hapax legomena. That means it's only used in one place in the entire New Testament. It's a word that implies they instigated the trouble. But when we get to chapter 14, verse 2, it shows that they were much more active in participating in the trouble, making this trouble after they saw their success back in Antioch. They broadened their attack as well. At Antioch, a city, they only instigated the honorable women and the city leaders. But in Iconium, they went directly to the Gentiles. That's what the text says which in itself is something that shows that they were violating their own separation code that Jews normally maintained from dealing directly with Gentiles. Jews always tried to use some kind of a compromising intermediary, but they would hear there clearly it says they are the ones that stirred up the Gentiles. They were so opposed to the gospel that they were willing to break their own ceremonial law. That's something that shows you the intensity of the Persecution that's beginning to develop. The second thing that they did here in the text is it says, they made their minds evil affected against the brethren. That's an additional level of attack. Just as we're going to see a further level when they tracked Paul and Barnabas to Lystra and Derby, the first level had been to raise righteous indignation and to expel. That was misdirected righteousness. But the second level that we see here is a poisoning of the minds. The third level, which we get to next, 
was physical attack, and that, the Lord willing, we'll see next week. So in this second level of attack, the phrase, made their minds evil affected against the brethren, we find a very common Greek word for bad is used, made their minds bad. But when you see that combination in a phrase, it means to make bitter, to poison, combined with the words for mind. Somehow they made the Gentiles bitter against Paul and Barnabas by poisoning the minds of the Gentiles. Perhaps it was slander, perhaps lies, false reports, exaggerated reports, perhaps criminal accusations or accusations of moral decadence with which this kind of accusation could be used. Notice how it says these reports were against the brethren. Now that may only be limited to Paul and his traveling companions, but it also may be a reference to those who had been converted from pagan religions. You see, religious pagans are also very defensive, not just Jews. If you've ever de dealt with a religious pagan, and all the world religions are pagan, as far as, as far as the gospel is concerned, but if you've ever dealt with anybody involved in a religion, they also have very strong opposition to the gospel. Religious to pagans are also defensive of their beliefs. We see that in the riot, for example, instigated by Demetrius and the craftsmen of Ephesus in the amphitheater where they were hollering for two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And most of them didn't even know why they were there, but hey, that sounds like a cool chant. Let's say it, you know, football game kind of stuff. The next observation I think is fascinating. It sort of centers around one little tiny word, and I emphasize that while reading this passage. It's the word, therefore. It's the word, therefore. The opposition brought a very specific result in the preaching of Paul and Silas. Verse 3. Long time, therefore. You know, they might have been only planning to stay a short time. But because the opposition came as it did, it says, Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. In other words, Paul extended his stay at Iconium because of the opposition. Most of us would try to cut our stay short. Paul extended his stay. He was not about to be driven out by mere words of opposition. Although we're going to discover as we get to verse 5, there is something that does drive him out. But opposition only made Paul preach more fervently. Did you also notice that little phrase, speaking boldly? That's the same thing that we saw in verse 36 of chapter 13. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said. Opposition merely made the gospel message more urgent. You know, when everybody's calm and quiet, you can have rational discourse, you can discuss the things of the Word of God. But when opposition arises, it makes the gospel message more urgent. You need to get it through. You need to shoot down the gainsayers. It's urgent. And folks, it's urgent for us today. It's urgent here in the United States of America. It's urgent here in Collingswood. There is much opposition to the gospel in this location. That's why I think that each location the opposition got more vicious. The opponents were desperately trying to find any method that would actually make Paul and Barnabas stop. They finally settled on trying to stone Paul, but God raised him back up. They thought that would stop him. That would shut him up. So don't be surprised if your sharing of the gospel has an increase in the level of opposition if you continue to be faithful in teaching the truth. But next thing we learn is, as opposition increased, so did the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't this interesting? Verse 3, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony. It's the Lord who's giving a testimony to the word of his grace when he does this. It says, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Opposition increases. The power of the Holy Spirit increases. Opposition increases, the power of the Holy Spirit increases. And in the apostolic era, the way that, that was manifest by the signs and wonders that God gave to the apostles to do. Gave testimony into the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So if you're in the center of the will of God, he gives more grace as the opposition increases and when the burdens grow greater as the great him proclaims.
God began to manifest the apostolic signs as the visible proof of the authenticity of the gospel message that Paul and Barnabas were carrying. Now, we've already done an extensive, many, many weeks study on the supernatural sign gifts. There were seven of them in past, past time. So we only note in passing here that the purpose of the seven sign gifts was specifically for authenticating the new message revealed to the apostles and prophets in the New Testament. Those are the 17 areas that are called mysteries in the New Testament. If you count them up, there are 17 of them. And you'll remember that the definition for a mystery in the New Testament, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but which is now revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That's how Paul defines a mystery. He's dealing with one specific mystery there, that Jews and Gentiles would be in the same body. But he gives us the definition of it. He says it's something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, but it's something that's now being revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The last thing that we note is that the preaching of the cross always makes a clear and distinct line between believers and unbelievers. The preaching of the cross will always make a distinct line between believers and unbelievers unbelievers. Verse 4, the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part held with the apostles. Isn't that interesting? There was no middle ground. And did you know when you're dealing with the truth of the word of God, there is no middle ground. When you're dealing with heaven and hell, there is no purgatory. There is no middle ground. When you're dealing with truth, if you mix in false doctrine, you no longer have the truth. You have a diluted or a polluted doctrine that you're preaching. Our Lord Jesus Christ makes it very clear that there will always be a clear and distinct line between believers and unbelievers. In Matthew chapter 10 and verses 34 through 39, our Lord Jesus Christ states it so. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man against variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That is precisely what Paul is doing in Acts chapter 14 verses 1 through 4. That's why there's a division at Iconium, where it says the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. A city clearly divided, and the line is the gospel of Christ, who Jesus is, what Jesus did. Dear people, when you proclaim Christ, does it establish a well-defined dividing line between truth and lies, between Christ and the devil, between life and death, between salvation and eternal damnation? The city understood. And when people understand, they will fall on one side or the other of that very bright line. We have in the law what's called a bright line test. Something that you know that anything to the right of the line is good and anything to the left of the line, you're out of luck in court. The multitude of the city was divided. Jesus says that division can even happen in families. Father against his son, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's foes shall be they of his own household. And Jesus said, what's the dividing line? It's me. He that loveth 
father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And verse 38, which is precisely what Paul and Barnabas were doing. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Paul and Barnabas were taking a cross. That's why they got the opposition and why Paul gets stoned when he goes to the next city. And the disciples think he's dead. People, it's not a pleasant thing to get stoned. Imagine people taking four to five pound rocks, throwing you on the ground, and throwing them as hard as they can at you, at your body, at your head, at your arms and legs, at your neck. Throwing them hard, picking them up, throwing them again, throwing them hard, picking them up, throwing them again, throwing them hard, picking them up, throwing them again, throwing hard. Until you're a bleeding mass of jelly on the ground. That's a method that the Jews used for killing people because you see the stone represented Jehovah of the Old Testament and for blasphemy what they would do is they would stone you because that's God's way of symbolically judging you with a physical object but which represents him. Take up your cross and follow me if you don't do it, you're not worthy of me, Jesus said. He that findeth his life shall lose it. How many of us think, man, the, the, the heat is getting a little hot. I'm going to get out of the kitchen. Heat is getting a little hot here, and I, I really don't think I want to suffer physically over this thing. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life, three key words, for my sake. Not for a good cause. Not for a false religion, not because you're a nice person, he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. This morning we talked about being excellent and zealous for Christ in all that we do. And how the challenge of Judy's death has burned that into my soul. I hope it burns it into your soul too. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. For the power of the gospel and for the brave men of God who have carried it generation after generation after generation. The faithful men who passed it to faithful men who passed it to faithful men who would be able to teach others also. And Father, it's reached us. And now it's our turn. We're in the line. The line of succession to pass it on to faithful men will be able to teach others also. Father, will we falter in this generation? Will we hesitate in this generation? Will we drop the torch in this generation? Will we backpedal and hide? Or will we not only carry the gospel, but in the places where we've received opposition, we go back again? And again, because the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Even so, Father, take your word tonight, use it in our hearts, challenge us to be men and women of God who are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's principal mission strategy, make us faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Spiritual warfare. We sang a hymn about it to begin. Let's turn and sing number 353, another about our spiritual warfare. And